Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. We're going to do a lot of yakking today about small farms and small farmer burnout. But before I do that, I want to update you on Miss Brownie, our very pregnant pig. Hi, Brownie. How are you? The old wisdom for sow pregnancies was, you know, pregnancy takes three months, three weeks, three days, and piglets come at 3 a.m. in the morning. Hillary went out last night after it was dark out, and Brownie looked restless. The mom will look restless before she has her pigs, where normally she'd just be snoozing. Hillary said, I don't know, I think they might come tonight. I said, geez, they're a week early, but they could. She went out later, and Brownie was sleeping. So, false alarm. She is due now in... Uh, seven days. Seven days. <laughs> On to small farmer burnout, which I think is an incredibly important to topic. I want more small farms to exist. Not fewer. And every time one leaves, I'm a little bit sad about that. And I have some personal experiences to share. This is nothing new. You know, it's been in the news for a long time. Farmer burnout, small farm burnout. It's a hard living to make. And every year, a lot of folks start small farms and a lot of folks fail at small farms. And I would like to provide some advice to keep that from happening maybe quite as much. I actually prepared for this video and I have an outline with lots of facts and figures. I have to talk about small farm churn, turnover, burnout via our, our farmer's market because that's where I see farms come and go. It's a really good representation of what's happening in our area. We live in a very vibrant local food economy composed of lots of farms like ours that are built to sell direct to consumer and aren't really involved too much in the commodity business that you might see in your area. It's, it's, it's an interesting and diverse mix. Anyway, our pavilion downtown holds... Uh, about 90 vendors, and of those vendors, 60, about 60 of them are farms. They have fixed percentages for the different categories, because we have three. There's agriculture and prepared food, and um, artisan vendors who make things. But there's about 60 occupied by farms, and every year, three of them, four of them, turn over. The, the person who has the, bo the booth reserved for them leaves, and another farm comes in. So if you do the math, you know, four or five out of 60, that's 5% leaving every year. And what happens is there's kind of this core of, of vendors who have booths reserved for them in the pavilion, those 90 booths that they've got in the pavilion. And then there's a big periphery of other vendors that are approved to sell at the market. And there's probably 250 total of them composed of all three of those categories that move in and take over those booths. So you've got people leaving and you've got people coming. That's a heck of a lot of turnover, 5% every year just in small farms. Now, I don't keep strict track of everybody that comes and goes at the farmer's market, but two notable farms left this year. And one was simply retirement. They'd done it for decades, sold it to market, were successful. And the other one decided to get out of farming and go into something else, which happens a lot. And when I look around the market, I see quite a few folks that have been there for decades. And it's obvious to me they've got the game figured out and they, they know how to make a living doing what they're doing. And then I see a lot of farms come and go very quickly where they get in, quite often they're young folks, and they'll last sometimes less than five years, around five years, and then they're gone. Why is that? Look at these gals all in a row looking at me. Accepting that farm that left because they're retiring, you have to assume something went wrong with the other ones that leave, right? Well, a bunch of things go wrong and something going wrong is based on not fulfilling some expectation the person had for the lifestyle and the business. So let's look at the expectations that people have when they get into small farming. Often it's an altruistic thing. It, Nobody gets into small farming because they're going to make a fortune. That's for sure. You expect a lot of hard work. But a lot of people get into small farming saying, I'm going to change the world or I'm going to help change the world. I want to see the world be different from what it is now. I want a decentralized food supply because that's more resilient in times of uncertainty. Absolutely true. They believe that locally grown and heritage breed foods, be it vegetables, 
meat, whatever it is, are healthier for you than some of the highly processed foods that are coming out of our centralized system. Small farms create thriving communities. You know, they keep people working within the community or local to the community. These are all altruistic things. They're all really good things about making the world a better place. They connect people directly to their food source. So the people I sell to, you can say, yep, I grew that, and this is how it was raised, and these are the details of it, and they get to know what agriculture is and the work involved and how their food is raised, and they feel good about that. There's a connection. There can be nothing wrong with all those things. It brings meaning back to the food that we eat. And there's a few other reasons that people get into it. They love farming, or at least they love the romanticism and the idea of farming. They may know how much work it is, maybe not. You don't know, but it definitely does have a sort of lifestyle romanticism about it. And they love being their own boss. They love being independent. I sure do love that. And not having anybody tell them what to do. With noble and idealistic goals, these farms enter the marketplace. And a significant percentage of them fail within the first five years. Why is that? Well, I've been around long enough to see enough come and go that I have a good idea of the reasons. And the first and foremost is money. It takes a lot of capital to start a farm and to expand a farm and to keep that farm running. You gotta have a lot of working capital and people just run out of gas in the capital department. It goes like the old story of the farmer that won the lottery, won a million dollars. People asked him, what are you gonna do with the million dollars you won? The farmer said, I'm gonna keep farming until the money's gone. Other reasons, first one related to that, that money thing is the pay stinks. You work long hours for little pay, and you're lucky if you make, make ends meet, not to mention stashing away money for a rainy day or your retirement. The work is hard. Small farms fail because the work is hard. Shoveling, raking, mucking, scooping, weeding, <laughs> lifting up heavy things, walking a lot, and working out in all kinds of inclement weather. It gets to people after a while and they figure out, well, that's really not my cup of tea. So they leave. There's psychological reasons that farms fail, I think. You're swimming against the stream. You're fighting against the rising tide when you have a small farm in a world that demands bigger, faster, and cheaper. And it gets to you sometimes. You think everybody's going this way and I'm going that way. Is there something wrong with me? The other psychological thing that happens is small farms often feel isolated because mainstream ag is the norm, commodity ag farming. So especially if you're in a small town like we are and you start a small farm, we're surrounded by commodity agriculture farms, dairy and crop farming, and it can be lonely. You don't have the support system that a lot of the commodity ag folks do where they all can get together in a room and kind of commiserate over common issues that they all share. It's like when you move into a small town and you never really feel like you're part of the inside group at the small town. There's people that have moved here that I've talked to that have lived here 20 or 30 years and this is a small town. They say, I, I'm still not an insider in the small town. It's the same way in agriculture. So those are psychological things that they wear on you. They wear on you when you're a small farmer. The last thing really in this basic group is that small farm business startups follow the same demographics as other small business startups. A lot of small business startups fail within the first five years, 10 years. Think about the restaurant business. How many restaurants are still in business 10 years after they make uh, a new start as a business or other small operations. It's just the odds are sometimes against you in a world where bigger is better. But I think the thing that kills more of them than anything else is a flaw in their business plan, something they overlooked if they had a business plan. I mean, look, we're, we're in an area where this is like local food central and 5% of new farms are going out, and why is that? Well, it's because it's a crowded marketplace. So if I show up at the market and I'm selling carrots, and seven other farmers are selling carrots there, why are the customers gonna come and buy from me? 
you know, it's not only the business plan, it's the marketing you do. You gotta, you gotta think that stuff through. So that list that I gave you is kind of a checklist. If these are the way small farms fail, then these are things you need to think about before you get started. I want to spend the rest of this video honing in on something, and that's the business plan, which I think is what trips up a lot of people. And it's amazing. When you look around at the folks at the farmer's market, there's a lot of people like me to which farming is their second career. So they've learned the ropes on business, and they know how to put a business plan together, you know, like I did from my old job. And I think they have a head start over someone who has never done that sort of thing. So the business plan, things I see go wrong all the time with business plan, folks underestimate the capital required to not only get going with, but maintain a farm. So you need capital both to start and you need continuing capital to expand your farm. You're, you're reinvesting money back into your farm as you grow. And, and you know, the third type of capital you need is things that pay your money that pays your living expenses you know it's all coming at you at the same time and that's why a lot of people they either have quite a bit of savings when they start or they start with a low overhead farm state a lot of young farmers around here will lease land until they can afford land and they work a full or part-time job and that's where the capital to fund the farms coming in and then once you get going you could start to bootstrap yourself up with earnings from the farm, but people always underestimate the amount of capital that's needed. There's things that you forget that you're going to need to buy. There's efficiencies of when you get up to scale, things that you didn't realize you're going to need to make your life easier. So that money always gets underestimated. The second thing that happens is people don't make an, an accurate market assessment. Like my example of growing and selling carrots, you know, you got to realize you're coming into a crowded marketplace and what's your cost for growing those carrots? What are you going to sell them for? What's the profit you're going to make? How many carrots are you going to have to grow to make a living off selling carrots? And why are people going to buy your carrots and what's that market like? It's not grow it and they will come, that's for sure, especially in a competitive marketplace like we exist in. People don't realize how slowly uh, it takes, to, how, slow, how slowly it is to scale up a farm when you're working direct to consumer. You can't just on year one have your customer base in order. It takes years and years to attract and keep a, a customer base. It took us five years to get to a sustainable customer base. There's no magic to gaining that. It, people have to get to know you. They have to become comfortable with your product. So. In that five years, you have to have a way to fund your life outside of the farm. <laughs> you know, all the expenses you're going to have until you grow to your full size. And once you get to that size, you have to say, is this sustainable? Can I do this? Hillary and I, in year five, were growing the maximum amount of livestock we ever had here on the farm. And on year five, we were saying to ourselves, can we continue doing this? And what happens is we age and started to think, <laughs> a couple years later I went into YouTube because we needed something to bring us into our later years. And that brings me to another important part of the business plan, which is when you budget for your farm and you say, well, I'm going to make so much profit per year and that's what I'm going to live off of, you got to take at least 10% off of that and stash it away just for a rainy day fund. For a major breakdown, something happens where you can't work for a while, that money needs to be going elsewhere. You can't be putting everything you make into your mouth, so to speak, and you've got to save some of that. And that's really hard. That makes the financial um, trick even harder to do. And you can add to that, you know, you get 10% for your rainy day fund, another 15% per year if you want to retire off the farm. I mean, a lot of people don't retire from farming, they just gradually slow down, but still you got a shortfall in money. So you're talking about not only making your living for today, but you're making an extra 25% for the rainy days and for the tomorrows. So that's it, the revolving door in small farms, finances, marketing, and hard work. That's really what it boils down to. I have no illusions that small farms are the future. They are certainly not. They're probably more part of our past than the future, unfortunately. 
but I think they're part of a mix. Any, anything is healthier the more mixture of components there are in it. Big farms, small farms, commodities, niche markets, all these things come together and make for a healthy food system. I hope this video was informative. I hope it reveals some rocks in the road for anybody that's getting started down this path. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time.